Subarachnoid hemorrhages most commonly occur due to rupture of an intracranial aneurysm. Many of these patients suffer a minor hemorrhage, also known as a warning leak, in the preceding days or weeks. The patient history may also reveal a connective tissue disease or polycystic kidney disease, both of which are associated with the presence of an intracranial aneurysm. A family history of a subarachnoid hemorrhage or predisposing condition can also be very helpful. Less common causes include rupture of an arterial venous malformation, trauma, and sympathomimetic drugs such as cocaine. Subarachnoid hemorrhages are characterized by the very sudden onset of a severe headache. The rapid onset has been described as a thunderclap because the headache reaches maximal intensity within seconds or minutes. It's also worth noting that in a large proportion of cases, the headache begins during physical exertion. The severity is another major clue, as even patients with a history of migraines will often describe this episode as the worst headache of their life. The patients, however, may experience milder symptoms or simply describe their headache as being different than usual. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is also often associated with a brief loss of consciousness, nausea and vomiting, seizures, and photophobia and neck stiffness, both of which are signs of meningeal irritation. Abnormal findings on the physical examination can be very limited. Many patients have normal neurologic examinations without any focal neurologic deficits. Nuchal rigidity, as well as Koenigs and Brzezinski sign, can occur due to meningeal irritation, but may not develop until several hours after the onset. Fendoscopy can be difficult to perform due to photophobia, but if the retina is visualized, there may be papilledema due to increased intracranial pressure or a subhyloid hemorrhage. A subhyloid hemorrhage is a less common finding, but is pathognomonic for a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the absence of blunt trauma. The ECG may show a variety of changes, ranging from ST and T-weave abnormalities to QT interval prolongation to arrhythmias. For example, this ECG was taken from a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Note the widespread ST segment elevation. It may be reasonable to order troponins in such a case, but do not give antiplatelets, anticoagulative therapy, or thrombolytics. The first test to order is a non-contrast CT scan of the head, which is very sensitive if obtained within 24 hours of onset. A lumbar puncture is only indicated if the CT is inconclusive and does not reveal any contraindications. The most characteristic finding in the cerebral spinal fluid is anthrochromia. However, it is usually not present until several hours after the onset of the hemorrhage. Other suggestive findings include the presence of erythrocytes and an elevated opening pressure. The presence of red blood cells may be due to a traumatic tap, in which case, fewer erythrocytes would be expected in the last tube in comparison with the first. If either the head CT or lumbar puncture are indicative of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then order an immediate neurosurgical consultation. A digital subtraction angiography is the preferred test to identify the etiology of the bleed. Aneurysms, if present, are usually occluded via surgical clipping or an endovascular coil. Initial management begins with patient stabilization and the correction of any physiologic derangements. You must aim to maintain euvolemia. If the patient is hypotensive, then give intravenous fluids but do not overhydrate the patient. For hypertensive patients, the general recommendation is to maintain blood pressure below 160 millimeters mercury with a titratable intravenous hypertensive, such as labetalol, nicardipine, or nalapril. Nitroprusset and nitroglycerin, however, should be avoided as they can increase intracranial pressure. Hyperglycemia is also associated with a poor outcome, and it should be treated while avoiding any dips into hypoglycemia. If the patient is on warfarin therapy, then stop the warfarin and infuse vitamin K, fresh frozen plasma, or factor IX complex. Treat any other correctable coagulopathy as well, such as low platelets. In order to reduce hemodynamic fluctuations, the patient should be placed in a dark and quiet room and be made as comfortable as possible. Stool softeners are given to reduce straining, which can increase intracranial pressure. In regards to analgesia, do not give aspirin or NSAIDs as they can affect platelet function. Caution is also required with strong opioids, which can exasperate nausea and vomiting or further increase confusion and drowsiness. Some complications include rebleeding, stroke due to cerebral vasospasm, communicating hydrocephalus, seizures, and central salt wasting due to the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. The mitopine can help reduce support outcome following a vasospasm, but it cannot prevent or treat a vasospasm itself.